Illinois State Trooper Dakota Cody Chapman Green. In October 2023, during what started off as a normal traffic stop in Springfield, Illinois, State Trooper Dakota Cody Chapman Green came face to face with a 37 year old man named Cristobal Santana, who was wanted for allegedly killing his girlfriend in Chicago two days prior. According to law enforcement, Santana shot 37 year old special education teacher Adriana Lopez 10 times outside her home before going on the run. The suspect also unloaded his gun's chamber on Chapman Green, who took multiple bullets to the leg just a few moments after approaching Santana's car. Santana then allegedly beat the trooper in the head with the firearm, fracturing the trooper's skull, breaking facial bones and causing an internal brain bleed. Chapman Green then ran for his life, but was determined to catch the fugitive despite his severe injuries. He got into his car and sped after Santana, who ran away on foot. Harrowing dashcam footage showed Santana being hit by the brave trooper's police cruiser and thrown through the air like a ragdoll, bringing the short-lived chase to a dramatic end. Paramedics rushed both Chapman Green and Santana to the emergency room, where they were hospitalized with serious injuries. Thanks to Chapman Green's quick thinking, Santana is now in custody on suspicion of several charges, including two counts of attempted first-degree murder, one count of aggravated battery with a firearm to a police officer, one count of aggravated battery to a police officer, and one count of aggravated unlawful use of a weapon. Santana pleaded not guilty to these crimes and remains held without bail pending the outcome of the case. Chapman Green spent a few weeks in the hospital and is currently taking his recovery day by day, but is recuperating well according to the most recent updates. 12. Officer Anne Marie Carrizales At about 3 o'clock in the morning in October 2013, 40 year old police officer and former US Marine Anne Carrizales approached a vehicle that was suspiciously stopped in the middle of the road in Stafford, Texas. Inside the car were three men who were later identified as MS-13 gang members. Just moments after Officer Carrizales started speaking with the driver, a man in the passenger seat whipped a gun and shot her twice at point-blank range, once in the face and once in the chest. According to the US Department of Justice, the bullet that hit Carrizales' face ricocheted off her cheekbone and nearly severed her earlobe. Thankfully, her bulletproof vest protected her organs from any major damage, but the shot to her chest was fired at such close range that it still pierced into her body and injured her. Despite the injuries, Carrizales was set on not letting the suspects get away. She fired four shots at the vehicle as the trio tried to escape, shattering their rear windshield, then got into her patrol car and chased them. Throughout the over 20-mile long pursuit, Carrizales managed to inform the dispatcher about the suspect's whereabouts and her own condition. The men eventually ditched the car at an apartment complex and continued running on foot, but Carrizales stayed right behind them. She was able to lead fellow officers from a neighboring police department to the suspects. There, they apprehended the accused gunman, while the other two men managed to avoid capture. Law enforcement called the remaining two suspects less than 48 hours later. Carrizales told NBC News that she had had a bad feeling when she first went up to the vehicle, and when she was shot, she was determined to not give up. In her own words, the wounded officer said, I had to stay in that fight because I am a mum, and they shot me, and they were absolutely not going to get away with that. She added, You can't shoot me and drive away, it's not allowed. In the immediate aftermath of the crime, Carrizales was called a hero. She was even honored by then-President Barack Obama for her heroic actions during this insane traffic stop gone wrong. Things took an unexpected turn a year later, when someone sued her for allegedly shooting at them during a traffic stop in October 2012, one year before Carrizales made headlines for chasing down the man who shot her. The plaintiff, Jay Mazok, accused her of firing an unnecessary shot and using excessive force while he sat motionless in a car. According to the lawsuit, Mazok, who had no previous criminal record, approached Carrizales and another officer while they were investigating a matter completely unrelated to what he wanted to talk to them about. 
Mazor claimed that the officers rudely told him to leave them alone and proceeded to hit him in the face with a metal object through the driver's side window of his car. The incident ended with Mazor getting arrested on suspicion of DWI and two counts of aggravated assault against the officers, with his car being considered a weapon used in the alleged assault. According to court documents, Mazor even tried closing his car window on the officers' arms. Carrizales denied all of the allegations put forth in the lawsuit, and the court ultimately ruled that Mazok failed to meet the burden of proof necessary to demonstrate that the officers used excessive force. According to Carrizales' Facebook page, she recovered from her injuries and now works as a reserve police officer while traveling the United States and sharing her story. 11. Quick Thinking Cop Takes Down Gunslinging Suspect in August 2023, while responding to a report about a gunslinging woman parading around outside a 7-Eleven store in Long Island, New York, Nassau County police officers came face to face with Kyber Calderon, a 31-year-old Brooklyn resident who also identifies as a 33-year-old woman named Hannah Carrillo. According to several news reports, the cops arrived and saw the suspect dangerously waving a pistol in broad daylight outside the store, which is located on a busy intersection. Calderon allegedly pointed the firearm at the responding officers, nearby motorists and themselves. They also reportedly shot the gun into the air, prompting one of the officers to knock them down with their patrol vehicle. The cop's SUV sideswiped Calderon, effectively ending the standoff while leaving the suspect with minor injuries. Shocking footage of the incident showed Calderon handling the gun recklessly, putting both themselves and those around them in danger just moments before getting hit by the car. Police recovered the loaded gun and put Calderon into custody on 13 separate charges, including reckless endangerment, three counts of menacing, two counts of menacing a police officer, and multiple possession counts. Meanwhile, the officer who struck Calderon took medical leave thanks to mental trauma he received from the incident. According to Nassau Police Commissioner Patrick Ryder, Calderon identified as male at the time of their police interview despite wearing women's clothing. Less than two months earlier, they'd been arrested twice in a short 20-minute span for two alleged burglaries in New York City. They were released both times thanks to the state's generous bail reform policies, which hardly ever allowed judges to impose cash bail in criminal court. Calderon was facing multiple burglary and trespassing charges in connection to their prior arrests at the time of the gun-slinging incident. The judge ordered the suspect to undergo a psychological evaluation and set their bail at $200,000. According to records, Calderon remains in custody while awaiting their upcoming court date. 10. Detective Michael Colazzo and Officer Rex Engelbert Shortly after 10 o'clock in the morning on March 27, 2023, 28-year-old Aidan Hale broke into a school in Nashville's Green Hills neighborhood by shooting through the building's glass doors. They then proceeded to open fire on people inside the building. Six victims were killed and at least one other person was injured. When police got to the scene 12 minutes after the first 9-11 call was placed, they could hear gunshots coming from inside the school. For the loved ones of the victims whose lives were taken that day, there would be no such thing as someone saving the day. It was already too late for that. But the officers were still determined to stop the shooter as soon as possible to prevent any more unnecessary deaths. Within two minutes of arriving at the school, a team of five officers approached Hale, who'd shot more than 150 rounds in less than 20 minutes. Detective Michael Colazzo and Officer Rex Engelbert each fired four times at the suspect. Hale was killed at the scene, and the two officers were named as heroes for putting an end to the senseless bloodshed. Officer Engelbert later told ABC News that he was in the area to conduct some official business at the time and that it wasn't a place he'd typically be. In his own words, he said, I think you can call it fate or God or whatever you want, but I can't count on both my hands the irregularities that put me in that position to answer the call for help. Colazzo and Engelbert were among the first officers to go inside the school, along with Detective Sergeant Jeff Mathis, who told ABC News that the team's training immediately kicked in as they stepped over a victim and set their emotions aside for the sake of neutralizing the threat. 
In hindsight, Mathers said he didn't know how he brought himself to walk over the dead person, but that his actions were driven mainly by a sense of purpose. He was aware that 911 calls were flooding into the dispatchers over the shooting, and that the situation was extremely serious. Once he heard the unmistakable sound of rifle shots firing, he knew there was no other choice but to jump into action. The team of officers received widespread praise for their brave and well-coordinated response to the shooting, which was all captured in chilling body cam footage. While even a single life lost is too many, who's to say how many more there would have been if not for the officers' quick response to the massacre? News of the tragedy shook the city of Nashville to its core and devastated the nation, where mass shootings have become too common to keep track. Hale took their reasons for committing the horrifying act of violence to the grave, leaving the world wondering why they murdered so many innocent strangers. There was some evidence suggesting that the perpetrator struggled with depression, but there didn't seem to be any outward signs of the impending carnage in the weeks leading up to the shooting. Upon further investigation, police reportedly found evidence that Hale had been planning the massacre for months, but they never revealed a motive beyond suggesting that the perpetrator harbored resentment toward the school, where they'd once attended as a student. Several months after the shooting, several of Hale's writings that police were trying to keep confidential were leaked to a conservative commentator named Stephen Crowder, who posted images of the text to his platform online. The journal entries contain hate-filled language directed at the school and its attendees, along with many racial and homophobic overtones. There was also a timeline detailing a series of events leading up to the murders. Described by some news sources as a manifesto, the writings make one thing clear. Hale's sole objective was to kill as many people as possible. As of December 2023, the identity of the person who leaked the writings is still a mystery. 9. Lamaya Wade and Officer Michael Jankowski A blind Washington, D.C. resident named Olivia Norman found herself in a horrific situation one night in September 2023 when she got lost in the Cleveland Park neighborhood with her seeing eye dog Tofu thanks to an unexpected construction and a sudden heavy storm. Disoriented and unsure of how she could get home, she called the city's 311 information line and asked for help, saying that she didn't mean to be a bother or use the city's resources, but that she really needed assistance reaching her home. Norman was quickly transferred to 911 dispatcher Lamaya Wade, who handled the situation like a pro despite only being on the job for a few months. Wade later told NBC Washington that Norman was calm but needed reassurance, so she stayed on the line with the woman until Officer Michael Jankowski found her. During the 911 call, Norman explained that construction workers had laid some gravel in an area where she normally crosses the street. She was struggling to find the crosswalk when it suddenly started to downpour, making her feel unsafe and anxious. Norman kept apologizing to Wade, who told her that there was no need to be sorry and that she wasn't being bothersome at all. Officer Jankowski then drove Norman and Tofu home and the problem was finally solved. Speaking with NBC, the officer said that it was raining pretty hard at the time he found Norman and that she was in a little bit of distress but extremely thankful for the help. While it was a simple task for Jankowski to help a lost citizen get home, his assistance saved Norman that day. A few months later, the grateful resident reunited with Jankowski and Wade and thanked them for being there when she needed a helping hand. Both Jankowski and Wade told the news outlet that they hoped Norman's story would serve as a reminder to other DC residents that it's okay to call 911 and that the police are on the job to help people. 8. U.S. Capitol Officer Eugene Goodman After serving in the Iraq War and leaving the United States military back in 2006, an Army veteran named Eugene Goodman became a U.S. Capitol Police Officer. He was working a shift in early 2021 when a crowd of violent demonstrators descended upon the Capitol in what became known as the infamous January 6th riot. Goodman was one of the first officers to meet the protesters face to face, and he was alone when he met with the angry crowd. Despite being greatly outnumbered, he refused to step down, and his decision to confront the intruders bought the occupants inside the Senate chamber much needed time to evacuate. 
To divert the demonstrators away from the chamber, Goodman shoved the crowd's leader, Doug Jensen, before running in the opposite direction of the room. By willingly making himself a target, Goodman lured many of the protesters away from armed officers who were guarding the chambers, which would have most likely led to a horrific deadly tragedy. Goodman was hailed as a hero for baiting and diverting the demonstrators, and his actions were praised as life-saving for people on every side of the confrontation. He later spoke out about the experience in court for the first time in June 2022, when he testified in the trial against father and son duo Kevin Seafried and Hunter Seafried. The defendants were in the first wave of rioters to breach the building. The elder Seafried even stormed into the Capitol with a Confederate battle flag in hand. Goodman told the court that when he tried to stop the flag-toting Seafried from going deeper into the building, the defendant jabbed him multiple times with the stick of the flag. He also accused Seafried of ignoring his commands to get back, by which point he'd run out of pepper spray and dropped his baton. Members of the crowd responded to the officers' orders with violent statements like, We're ready for war, and the Seafreeds allegedly taunted Goodman with sarcastic remarks saying, What are you gonna do? Shoot us? During his testimony, Goodman also described how the rioters he faced doused him with a substance he believed was bear spray, threw objects at him, and tried shaking him and other officers off of scaffolding they were standing on. He also remembered vomiting from tear gas that Metro DC officers deployed after arriving to offer backup to the overrun Capitol Police. In his words, Goodman compared the scene to medieval times, where you see one big force fighting another force. Goodman's brave actions during the encounter with the crowd of demonstrators were captured on camera, and another clip showed him leading Senator Mitt Romney away from the protesters. In one video, Goodman was seen running away from the rioters while shouting into his radio about the chaos unfolding. The officer was praised by legislators from both sides of the aisle for his quick thinking, and he was commended by his former army unit, the 18th Airborne Corps. Goodman was also credited with saving the lives of many people who were in the building and trying to evacuate when the intruders laid siege to the capital. He and all of the other officers who responded to the attack were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal for their bravery. 7. Port Authority Officer Kevin Columba In October 2023, after working the graveyard shift at the George Washington Bridge as an officer for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, 35-year-old Kevin Columba began his drive home to Warwick, New York. While traveling along State Route 17A, he found a fiery car wreck involving two vehicles that had crashed head-on. The off-duty cop immediately rushed over to the accident site and pulled a driver out from one of the vehicles. He then rescued the driver of the other car by pulling her through a window. There was a passenger trapped in the car as the blaze was spreading rapidly. Columba raced against the clock to grab her from the car. He yelled for the woman to cover her face, then used a punch-out tool to break open the window. By the time Columba removed the passenger from the car, it was almost completely engulfed in flames. Emergency responders rushed the three victims to hospital, where they were given treatment for non-life-threatening injuries. Speaking with the New York Post, Port Authority Police Benevolent Association President Frank Conti said, the agency's officers are committed to putting others before themselves while on and off duty. He credited Columba with saving the car crash victims' lives. And it's true that Columba's life revolves around helping people in need. On top of being a seven-year member of the police force, he's a captain with the Warwick Fire Department, where he's been a volunteer firefighter for over 17 years. 6. U.S. Coast Guard Petty Officer 2nd Class Nathaniel Howard While waiting for their diner reservation at an Ohio restaurant one day in April 2022, United States Coast Guard Petty Officer 2nd Class Nathaniel Howard and his wife decided to go look out over the Cuyahoga River. At that exact moment, they saw a woman being helplessly dragged along by the 44-degree current. Later identified as Saren Whipple, the woman had fallen out of her kayak without a life jacket on, and she was heading towards several deadly waterfalls. Even if she somehow managed to avoid getting washed over the falls, she faced the possibility of suffering from hypothermia. 
According to experts, death can happen in just one to three hours in water temperatures of 40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. But it takes less than five minutes for a person to lose their dexterity and 30 to 60 minutes for the individual to suffer exhaustion or fall unconscious. Whipple made direct eye contact with Howard, who immediately sprang into action despite being above her on an overlook. Determined to save the woman, Howard rushed down three flights of stairs to get to the river. He managed to make it just in time to wade into the river, pluck Whipple up from the rapids, and pull her to shore. As soon as Howard got Sharon to dry land, the woman's husband also came flowing down the river. He'd lost his footing and fallen into the water while trying to pull Sharon out to safety, and now he was caught in the current as well. Both husband and wife were rescued by Howard, who later told local news station WKYC that he didn't even stop to consider whether or not he should try saving the Whipples. In December 2023, the Coast Guard presented him with the Silver Life Saving Medal, which is awarded to both military and civilian US citizens who endeavor to rescue a person from water-related dangers, including drowning and shipwrecks. During the ceremony, Captain Mark Cooperman said that if it weren't for Howard, two lives would have been lost. Speaking with WKYC, Sharon Whipple said that it was the one time she'd gone kayaking without wearing a life vest. She told the news station that the experience taught her several lessons about safety and served as a good reminder that there are still good people in the world who care and will help a stranger. 5. Lieutenant Antonio Bailey August 26, 2023 started off as a normal Saturday for Lieutenant Antonio Bailey, who works as a security officer at Edward Waters University in Jacksonville, Florida. His shift at the historically black college suddenly turned chaotic when a group of students pulled up next to his car and said they saw a suspicious man in the staff parking lot. The concerned students told Bailey that they'd seen the man putting on a bulletproof vest, gloves, and even a mask. Determined to keep everyone on campus safe that day, Bailey immediately went out and approached the suspect. Later identified as 21-year-old Ryan Palmeter, the suspicious man fled in his car as soon as he saw the officer. Bailey then chased after Palmeter as far as his job allowed. When he no longer had the authority to pursue the suspect, he contacted the Jacksonville Sheriff and gave them Palmeter's license plate number. A short while later, Palmeter shot and killed three black customers at a nearby Dollar General store. It became clear at that point that Bailey's response to the concerned students who reported Palmeter's presence may have spared the 1,200 people on campus that day from life-threatening danger. During a news conference, Bailey said that he could tell something was off about Palmeter as soon as he saw him. He denied being a hero, though, instead crediting the students who reported Palmeter to him with being the actual lifesavers. Bailey said that he wished he had more jurisdiction to pursue and detain Palmeter, but that he had to follow his employer's protocols. He was deeply saddened by the senseless shooting that followed. It's unclear whether Palmeter planned to attack anyone at the university. In a statement made by Jacksonville Sheriff T.K. Waters, he said that the suspect may have been in the parking lot just to change into his shooter gear, with plans to commit the massacre somewhere else. Waters also pointed out that Palmeter had many opportunities to carry out a violent act at the college, but decided not to. The school's president, A. Zachary Faison Jr., didn't outwardly disagree with Waters, but pointed out that Palmeter's crimes were very clearly racially motivated, based on the prejudice rambling scene in his manifesto. The deranged shooter passed away at the scene of the murders, leaving many unanswered questions about how and why his mental state deteriorated to the point where he thought killing innocent people was appropriate. But it's certainly plausible to think that if the university students and Lieutenant Bailey hadn't acted as they did, more people could have lost their lives that day. 4. Officer Chris DeRose and Former Officer Justin Busan in August 2013, a 26-year-old expecting mother from Philadelphia named Camille Young went into labor two weeks before her due date. She quickly called a friend to take her to the hospital, but by the time they got on the road, Camille's daughter, Amini, was already ready to enter the world. The unborn baby's panicked father, Derek Reed, approached the first patrol car he spotted. 
in it were Temple University officers Krista Rose and Justin Busan, whose otherwise uneventful day suddenly spiraled when Reed ran up to them and yelled that his girlfriend was having her baby in a car park nearby. DeRose and Busam immediately rushed over to the vehicle that had suddenly become a makeshift delivery room. Camille told them that the baby was going to be born at any moment, so the officers grabbed what medical supplies were available to them and helped deliver Amini. Thanks to their help, both mother and baby were healthy and safe after the birth. They were taken to the university's hospital, where Camille got the chance to thank the officers for stepping in when they were needed most. As Amini's 10th birthday approached in 2023, the family reunited with DeRose and Busam to reflect on that day. Busam, who now works for the Southern Chester County Regional Police Department, told Temple University's Temple Now newsletter that he remembered the moment he first heard Amini cry. He said it was so rewarding to see the little girl thriving over a decade later and that he became emotional despite being an experienced law enforcement officer who's learned to keep control of his feelings throughout his career. Even though she obviously has no memory of her birth, Amini expressed her gratitude toward the officers, describing their presence that day as a miracle. She said she waited her whole life for the chance to meet DeRose and Busap and give each of them a card that said, I will never forget this moment in my life. Speaking with Temple Now, Vice President for Public Safety Jennifer Griffin pointed out that half of the calls that the university's police respond to do not involve students and happen off campus. She described the officer's help with the Meanie's birth as just another example of Temple police officers serving our community. 3. Louisville Metro Officers Nicholas Wilt and Corey Galloway Not long after 8.30 a.m. on April 10, 2023, a 25-year-old bank employee named Connor Sturgeon went inside his workplace in Louisville, Kentucky with an AR-15 and opened fire on his shocked co-workers who were gathered in a conference room waiting for a meeting. He live-streamed the brutality on his social media as officers from the Louisville Metro Police Department rushed the scene. Police got to the bank three minutes after the first 911 call was placed and engaged in a shootout with Sturgeon, who'd set himself up in a position to ambush the responding officers. By then, Sturgeon had already killed five of the bank's employees. At least eight other people were injured in the shooting, including two police officers. One of the wounded cops, 26-year-old Nicholas Wilt, who graduated from the police academy only 10 days prior and was working his fourth shift. Without hesitation, Wilt ran headfirst towards Sturgeon, who shot the officer in the head. The critically injured rookie cop responded to the scene with his training officer, Corey Galloway, who fatally shot Sturgeon during the exchange. Wilt was immediately rushed to the hospital, where he underwent emergency brain surgery while Galloway was hospitalized with a gunshot wound in his elbow. During a press conference, Interim Police Chief Jacqueline Gwynne Villaroyal said that the victim count would have been much higher if it weren't for officers Wilt and Galloway, who put their own lives on the line to stop any more civilians from being harmed or killed. Wilt spent almost four months in the hospital before being discharged in late July. While leaving the hospital marked a major milestone in his healing process, he continues to face a long road to recovery. After being released, Wilt entered an intensive five-day-per-week outpatient therapy program. His brother, Zach Wilt, told ABC News that Nicholas looked forward to doing simple things again, like sleeping in his own bed and eating a steak dinner. In November 2023, the Wilt family revealed that Nicholas was making great progress in his recovery and that he was now down to three days of therapy per week. He is still relearning basic tasks that most people take for granted, like walking, and he struggles with limited mobility and using his left arm. About a month before the update, Wilt experienced a setback thanks to a buildup of spinal fluid in his skull. Doctors said that his condition seemed to have stabilized since then, but that they would continue to monitor the situation in order to determine if any additional procedures were needed. It's too soon to tell whether Wilt will, will ever return to the police force. For now, he and his family are taking things slow, day by day, and he remains committed to his recovery. 2. Officer Chad Swanson 
In 2017, a deranged gunman opened fire on a crowd of concertgoers at the Route 91 Harvest Music Festival in Las Vegas. 64-year-old Stephen Paddock was hiding in a 32nd floor suite of the Mandalay Bay Hotel with a huge stockpile of guns and ammunition. He barricaded himself inside the room and fired over 1,000 bullets on the concert attendees below, killing about 60 people and injuring over 400 more. The ensuing chaos caused spectators to scramble to get out of the gunman's path and to safety. In a situation where time was of the essence and there was no such thing as too much help, an off-duty cop from Manhattan Beach, California, named Chad Swanson instantly stepped in to help others. Swanson was at the concert as a civilian, but his police instincts kicked in the moment he realized something terrible was happening. Instead of running for cover and worrying about himself and his group, he helped get injured victims and scared concertgoers out of the area. Sadly, another tragedy claimed the 35-year-old's life about six years later in October 2023. Swanson was driving to work on his police motorcycle at 5.15 in the morning when a car made an unsafe lane change alongside him on the highway. The car hit another vehicle, which collided with Swanson's motorcycle. The officer of 13 years was ejected from his bike and killed by his injuries, leaving behind a devastated wife and three sons. During a press conference, Manhattan Beach Mayor Richard Montgomery commended Swanson for his fearless contributions to the community and beyond, which were marked by bravery, integrity, and an unwavering commitment to duty. On top of his brave actions at the Las Vegas concert, the fallen officer was remembered as an everyday hero who touched so many lives during his short lifetime. And now for number one. But if you want to hear more bizarre and crazy stories, stay tuned after the video for some more content. 1. Officer Ryan Franzak During a vacation to Arizona in July 2023, off-duty Palos Park, Illinois police officer Ryan Franzak overheard someone saying that an elderly man fell off his raft while tubing on the Gila and Salt Rivers. He later told CBS2 Chicago after the incident that as soon as he looked over and saw an empty tube floating along the rapids, he dove into the water without a second thought and started feeling around for the missing man. Franczak said he grew increasingly worried as the moments passed and the man failed to come up out of the water, but he eventually located the tuber and pulled him to shore with another bystander. Franczak performed the heroic deed while he was off the clock simply as a good Samaritan who stepped in to help when someone was in danger. His actions reflect the values and morals of the Palos Park Police Department, according to the agency's commissioner, Dan Polk, who mentioned a mantra shared among all police officers is that we are never truly off-duty. The off-duty cop's willingness to put his own safety at risk during his free time spoke volumes to how much he loves being an officer. In his own words, Frank Zag considers being a police officer a 24-7 job and that he's always ready to jump in. Number 16. James Matt French In March 2023, a police officer was patrolling the streets in Oklahoma City at 2 a.m. when he noticed an SUV speeding and swerving between lanes. He followed the car as it turned into a subdivision without a turn signal and conducted a traffic stop as it slowly pulled into a driveway. Behind the wheel was an off-duty police captain named James Matt French, who was a 32-year veteran of the force. The officer on duty observed the distinct smell of alcohol as he spoke with French and noticed that the captain's eyes were glassy and his speech was very slurred. In a conversation that was caught on body cam footage, French identified himself and said he was on his way home after having a few beers at a poker game. He asked the arresting officer to turn his body camera off multiple times, but the officer refused and said he was not going to give the man any special treatment. French performed poorly on all of the field sobriety tests and was taken into custody on suspicion of DUI. He was placed on administrative leave pending the outcome of his criminal case and an internal investigation. Oklahoma City Police Chief Wade Gawley declined to go into detail about why he thought French requested that the officer turn his body camera off, but praised the cop's professionalism in handling the situation. The case is ongoing, so we'll have to wait for the outcome. Number 15. Stephen Jones 
34-year-old father of two, Stephen Jones, was working as a police sergeant in Northern Wales when he decided to start cheating on his wife, 37-year-old Madeline Jones, with a local barmaid back in 1992. He completely lost interest in his marriage during the excitement of the affair, but he wasn't interested in the potential costs of a divorce and believed that leaving Madeline would ruin his chances for a promotion at work. So, to avoid this, late one night in early 1993, Jones lured his wife into their garage by pretending her brother had a heart attack. He then killed her with a single blow to the head using his police baton and put a garbage bag over her face to stop blood from getting everywhere. Jones loaded his wife's dead body into her car, drove it down an embankment, and right into a tree. He then placed the corpse in a nearby stream to make it look like Madeline had flown through the windshield in a car accident. Someone quickly saw the car and called the police. It happened so fast that Jones had no time to get rid of the evidence at his house before his colleagues came by to comfort him. By then, investigators at the scene were already finding suspicious signs that the crash was staged. Jones, who stood over a foot taller than his wife, forgot to pull the seat back up before placing Madeline behind the wheel. She was way too short to have been driving the car with the seat set so far back. Even before an autopsy was performed, forensic detectives noticed that Madeline's head injuries were inconsistent with those of a typical car accident. And there was also no glass in her hair, making it highly doubtful that she went through the windshield. In the trunk of Jones's car, police found his police helmet, which he wore to prevent injury when he crashed Madeline's car. They also found a bloody baton that he had used to kill her. He had taken out multiple life insurance policies on his wife and stood to gain tens of thousands of dollars from her death. It may not sound like much in today's standards, but it was a substantial amount of money 30 years ago. Luckily, he was arrested and charged with Madeline's murder before he could cash it all in. During his trial, Jones claimed Madeline died after simply falling and hitting her head. He said he panicked and staged the accident out of fear that he would be blamed for her death. Prosecutors, on the other hand, accused Jones of a cold and calculated murder, saying that he used his police experience to his advantage in his cover-up attempt. He was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Number 14. Nicholas Tartaglioni In 2008, former law enforcement officer Nicholas Tartaglioni retired from the Briarcliff Manor Police Department in New York after suffering an injury. He spent the next few years living on a quiet ranch in Otisville, about 70 miles north of New York City. During that time, he secretly started running a drug ring with the help of Joseph Biggs, a bodybuilder who worked for Tartaglioni as an enforcer, and Gerard Benderoth, a retired NYPD officer and bodybuilder who also added muscle to the operation. In 2015, Tartaglioni paid a landscaper named Martin Luna to buy cocaine in Mexico and sell it in Florida. The drugs were sold as promised, the customers were apparently happy, and Tartaglioni quickly sent Luna back to Mexico. Mexico with $200,000 for another shipment of the product. This time, Luna returned to New York empty-handed, claiming that the dealers he paid ran off with the money and never actually gave him the drugs. One day in April 2016, Tartaglioni, Benderoth, and Biggs lured Luna to a bar to discuss the potential job opportunity. Luna brought along some of his nephews, Miguel Luna and Urbano Santiago, and a family friend named Hector Gutierrez. As soon as the men entered the bar, they were ordered to get on the floor at gunpoint and were bound with duct tape. Tartaglioni tortured Luna and strangled him to death with a zip tie while forcing his nephews to watch. He then loaded the body into his truck and drove to his property while his associates transported the three other captives. Santiago, Gutierrez, and Miguel were ordered to their knees, shot dead and buried at the remote wooded site. While the murder of Martin Luna was planned, the other three men were just collateral damage. They were not involved in the drug activities and just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Eight months later, the FBI charged Tartaglioni with 17 counts, including murder, kidnapping, and a handful of drug and gun charges. He famously shared a cell with Jeffrey Epstein, 
who accused Tartag Leone of assault. Agents pulled Benderoth over in 2017, but he took his own life before they could apprehend him. Biggs was arrested only a few months later. Facing the same charges as Tartag Leone and a potential life sentence, Biggs decided to cooperate in hopes of possibly seeing freedom again in his lifetime. Because Tartag Leone maintained his innocence and Benderoth was dead, authorities had no choice but to go by Biggs' version of events. He promised to be truthful under the condition that he would face a life sentence if caught in a single lie. Biggs admitted to shooting one of the victims and pleaded guilty to multiple charges, including murder. He is currently awaiting sentencing and could still face life in prison despite his cooperation. Tartaglioni's lawyers argued that their client was set up by his associates as a fall guy and that he was not involved in the murders. Unswayed by the defense's claims, a jury convicted him on every count. Prosecutors did not seek the death penalty though, which means he'll likely face life behind bars when sentenced in October 2023. Number 13. Andre Reddit after being handed divorce papers in January 2023, a 27-year-old police officer from St. Gabriel, Louisiana named Andre Reddit began stalking his estranged wife. On March 1st, someone entered the woman's home and fired several rounds at an overnight visitor, 26-year-old National Guardsman Dylan Martin. The victim died thanks to his injuries. Shortly after the fatal shooting, Reddit showed up at a nearby hospital with a stab wound authorities believe he sustained during the attack. He was placed on administrative leave and charged with second-degree murder, stalking and obstruction of justice in connection to both the shooting and a previous incident in which he allegedly stalked his ex-lover. According to police, Reddit and his estranged wife had temporary restraining orders against one another at the time of the shooting. Shortly afterwards, his wife filed for a permanent restraining order and chose to move forward with charges from prior incidents with Reddit. Number 12. Virginia Cops Face Murder Charges in early March 2023, officers with the Henrico County Police Department in Virginia responded to a call from a civilian about their neighbor. After discussing the matter with the man, 28-year-old Ervo Noel Otieno, officers concluded that the call was mental health related instead of criminal and left without making any arrests. The next morning, police responded to another call about a suspected burglary involving Otieno. This time, they placed him under an emergency custody order, which is used when someone seems to be having a mental health crisis, and took him to a hospital. While there, Otieno allegedly became assaultive toward the officers and was taken to a local jail, booked on charges of assaulting an officer, disorderly conduct, and vandalism. Three days later, he was transferred to a state hospital. During the intake process, Multiple officers and hospital employees had to pin Otieno to the floor, despite him being shackled and handcuffed. Footage of the incident revealed that Otieno was restrained for about 20 minutes, spending much of it face down on the floor. At some point, staff members realized that Otieno had actually gone limp. They tried to resuscitate him, but he never regained consciousness and ultimately passed away. An autopsy concluded that Otieno had been asphyxiated. Seven deputies, Randy Boyer, Dwayne Bramble, Jermaine Branch, Bradley Diss, Tabitha Levere, Brandon Rogers, and K.L. Sanders, are now facing second-degree murder charges for what the prosecution has described as a smothering death. Three hospital workers were also charged in connection to the incident. Lawyers for Otieno's family have described the tragedy as yet another case of law enforcement excessively restraining someone in mental distress who was subjected to malicious treatment when he really needed compassion and medical help. The case is ongoing, but what are your thoughts? Number 11. Eric Bennett in January 2023, law enforcement in Monmouth County, New Jersey, arrested 46-year-old Seabright officer Eric A. Bennett for allegedly stalking his recent ex-girlfriend. The couple had broken up just two months earlier after dating for a short time. According to a criminal complaint, Bennett showed up uninvited at the woman's home days later and threatened to hurt her. The alleged victim installed security cameras at her home and blocked Bennett from contacting her after this. But but about a month later, she started to get threatening messages on social media from an unknown user. A few days after that, someone slashed all her tires, keyed the side of her car, ripped a flagpole off her house, 
and tore down her security cameras. Investigators were able to put Bennett near the woman's house at the time of the vandalism, and they also discovered that he had used police computers to research the woman and people in her life over 30 times. During one incident, he allegedly threatened to harm the victim with a knife. When questioned by his supervisors, Bennett admitted to taking down her security cameras so he wouldn't be seen slashing her tires. Bennett was hit with a list of charges, including pattern of official misconduct, two counts of official misconduct, two counts of computer theft, criminal mischief, making terroristic threats, cyber harassment, hindering apprehension, identity theft, and stalking. He was suspended from the force without pay and held in jail pending the next step in his case. Number 10. Wayne Cousins 33-year-old Sarah Everard was walking home from a friend's house in London one night back in 2021 when Metropolitan Police Officer Wayne Cousins falsely arrested her for violating COVID-19 regulations. But instead of taking Sarah to the police station like she expected, Cousins drove her straight to the remote outskirts of Dover, where he proceeded to brutally assault and strangle her to death with his police belt. He then set her body on fire and fled the scene. After being implicated in the crime based on surveillance footage, Cousins claimed that an Eastern European gang forced him to commit the crime. As he awaited trial for Sarah's murder, his arrest triggered widespread outrage toward the Metropolitan Police for missing multiple warning signs that many believe could have prevented the deadly assault from ever taking place. Included among these red flags were multiple indecent exposure incidents stemming as far back as 2015, two of which happened at fast food drive throughs only days before Sarah's murder. Another complaint accused Cousins of stepping in front of a woman on her bike in a wooded area, buck naked, in 2020, when he was supposed to be working from home at the time. In 2018, Cousins apparently assaulted a drag performer, and on another occasion a prostitute stormed into the police station, demanding payment from him. After the murder, Cousin's wife was left reeling over her failure to spot warning signs that her husband was capable of unspeakable violence. At the end of the day, though, she was just one of several people who gave him the benefit of the doubt. Cousins pleaded guilty to Sarah's murder and was handed a life sentence, which means he will stay behind bars until his dying day. Number 9. Bobby Cutts Jr. 26-year-old Jesse Davis was almost nine months pregnant when she suddenly vanished back in 2008. Her mother found her son home alone and noticed the smell of bleach, instantly making her fear the worst. While Jesse's son was too young to say exactly what happened, he made some disturbing statements that suggested she had met her end with foul play. The Canton Police Department repeatedly told the media that it did not consider Jesse's boyfriend and the father of her children, Officer Bobby Cutch Jr., a suspect in the case at all. But they turned out to be wrong, and answers soon came as the local sheriff's department and the FBI looked into the case. During the time Jesse was gone, Cutts was already active on a dating site. He also avoided the press and only gave one interview, during which he wept and denied any involvement. Nine days after the young woman disappeared, Cutts finally confessed and led police to her body. He was arrested for murder and aggravated murder the same day. During his trial, Cutts took the stand in his own defense and claimed he accidentally killed Jesse by elbowing her in the throat during an argument after she bit his finger, causing her to fall backwards and die from injuries. He supposedly got scared afterwards, so he hid her body in the woods. The prosecution accused Cutts of strangling Jesse to death in cold blood. Jesse's family echoed similar sentiments. In an impact statement, the slain woman's sister, Whitney Davis, accused Cutts of throwing away her sister simply because she became an inconvenience to him. Whitney said that Cutts was only sorry he got caught and that he lacked genuine remorse for what he did. A jury convicted Cutts of both murder charges, which made him eligible for the death penalty in Ohio. He pleaded with the court to spare his life and was instead sentenced to 57 years to life in prison. Number 8. Blair Christopher Hall In 2007, while renovating the bathroom at their California home, retired San Bernardino narcotics detective Blair Christopher Hall and his wife, Christy Lynn, were hanging out in their outdoor jacuzzi. After hearing a scream from the couple's backyard one day, neighbor Lindsay K. Patterson looked over a wall separating the properties. 
She saw Christy Lynn face down in her bathing suit and Hall perched over her with one hand holding her head and another on her back. Assuming they were just being intimate, Patterson quickly looked away, but she was unable to shake the suspicion that something wasn't right, so she looked one more time and saw Hall relaxing in the hot tub with Christy nowhere in sight. A little while later, Hall rushed his wife to the emergency room, claiming that he found her motionless in the jacuzzi after coming back from using the bathroom. He said he tried to perform CPR before bringing Christy to the hospital where she was pronounced dead. After noticing multiple injuries on Christie's body, including cuts, abrasions, and bruises, as well as hemorrhaging in the eyes and mouth, County Medical Examiner Dr. Mark Scott McCormick concluded that the victim had been forcefully drowned. Hall was then charged with first-degree murder. He denied killing his wife and received unwavering support from their three children during the case. Prosecutors dismissed his claims of innocence, though, and pointed toward an $800,000 life insurance policy as a possible motive. As the trial unfolded, media reports revealed that Hall's police record was less than stellar. After working as an officer for 12 years and retiring in 1994 due to a gunshot wound, he became the police chief of two Idaho towns. He was let go after being accused and convicted of a felony charge for embezzling $19,000 from a drug task fund, but managed to avoid prison time. The first trial for Christie's murder ended in a hung jury, but Hall's second trial concluded with a guilty verdict and a sentence of 25 years to life in prison for the killer. Number 7. Amber Geiger Dallas police officer Amber Geiger just finished up her shift and was going home on the night of September 6, 2018, when she lost track of which floor of her apartment building she was on. She accidentally entered the wrong unit, even though the door was clearly labeled with a number that should have told her she was on the third floor instead of the fourth. There was also a bright red doormat that looked nothing like hers, but she somehow didn't notice any of these things. She opened the door to see an African-American man she didn't recognize sitting on his own sofa eating ice cream. He was unarmed and not threatening in any way, yet Geiger still pulled out her service weapon and fired at him twice, hitting him in the chest. Now that the damage was done, Geiger suddenly recognized her mistake and called 911. It was unfortunately too late to save 26-year-old Botham Jean, who died from his injuries. Geiger was initially arrested for manslaughter, but the charge was upgraded to murder. In the meantime, protests broke out across the US over the numbers of unarmed black men that were dying by the hands of police. Geiger argued that she believed she was at her apartment and simply mistook Jean for an intruder. Prosecutors accused her of missing multiple signs that she was in the wrong place since she was distracted by flirtatious text messages she was exchanging with her married police partner, Martin Rivera. When the shooting happened, the pair were caught up in a year-long affair and were in the middle of planning a rendezvous for later that night. The defense argued that Geiger wasn't distracted by the steamy messages, but that she was simply operating on autopilot and acting out of habit. Even if this were the case, the court did not believe that her lack of awareness gave her a good enough reason to open fire. Geiger was convicted of murder and sentenced to 10 years in prison. Her sentence is scheduled to run until 2029, but she could be paroled by 2024. Number 6. Kwaku Riley Agyapon Known to the Ranlo, North Carolina community as Officer Riley, Kwaku Riley Agipon responded to a domestic violence complaint at 33-year-old Juan Nikely Avalo's home in November 2022. Avalo was accused of assaulting and threatening his wife, who Agipon stayed in touch with after responding to the call. When Avalo discovered Officer Riley's number in his wife's phone, the men decided to speak with one another. According to reports, Agipon challenged Avalo to meet up and fight him at a gas station. Instead, he showed up at Avalo's house at 2 in the morning on New Year's Day, and the men fought it out there. During the altercation, Avalo stabbed the off-duty police officer who, in response, allegedly pulled a gun and pulled the trigger five times, shooting and killing Avalo in the head. Investigators believe that Avalo had dropped the knife by this point and was trying to escape when he was killed. He was reportedly shot from at least 75 feet away, suggesting that he posed no immediate threat to Agyapon. The Ranlo Police Department quickly turned the investigation over to state authorities. Based on the evidence, they charged Agyapon with first-degree murder. Ten days later, Agyapon was fired. He reportedly refused to sign the termination notice delivered to him at the jail, where he's currently being held without bond. 
Agapon was only on the Renlo force for a little over four months, and it was already his second time leaving a law enforcement job. For just over two years starting in October 2019, Agapon worked for the nearby Gastonia Police Department. The school district spokesperson told the Gazette that he was accused of stopping a school bus from finishing its route while questioning the driver about a student's behavior. The details surrounding the incidents are vague, and a charge against Agapon was not pursued. He formally separated from the Gastonia Police Department in April 2022 and was sworn in as a Ranlow officer a few months later. Number 5. Eric Bergen 28-year-old Cynthia Kempf was managing a Safeway store in California's Bay Area back in 1998 when four men abducted her as part of a plot to get into the business's safe. After seeing a police cruiser drive through the store's parking lot, the kidnappers aborted their plan and instead drove Cynthia to a secluded field. They put a bag over her head, bound her wrists, and fatally shot her in the back as she helplessly laid on the ground. Investigators eventually traced the crime to 28-year-old Eric Bergen, a former officer who quit the force three months after Cynthia's murder while being investigated for police brutality. Bergen admitted to committing about a dozen unrelated robberies over a five-month period after leaving his job, but a murder charge for killing Cynthia was dropped thanks to a lack of evidence. He went to prison for the robberies and was set to be released in 1994 when prosecutors finally managed to find enough evidence to indict him for Cynthia's murder. They did this by promising immunity to Mario Salguero, Bergen's co-conspirator in the robberies who was also suspected of being involved in Cynthia's death. When he agreed to work with them, Salguero was serving a 17-year sentence for the robberies. As promised, he incurred no further punishment for the botched Safeway incident. Bergen's brother Carl also struck a deal with prosecutors and testified in exchange for a 10-year sentence, and a fourth conspirator, former Pittsburgh Police Sergeant George Elsey, was given 12 years. In court, Eric argued that he deserved leniency since everyone else involved in the crime received a lighter sentence. Meanwhile, Cynthia's family implored the court to impose a full life term. The judge overseeing the case acknowledged that the justice system can be unfair at times. In Eric's case, this meant giving two men a slap on the wrist and allowing another to get away with the crime entirely for the sake of securing a conviction solely against him. But that's unfortunately the way things go sometimes, and while the judge wasn't thrilled about how things turned out for Eric's accomplices, he saw no reason not to impose what he felt was a fair sentence against Eric. Bergen was handed two life terms, with the possibility of parole starting in 2017. His parole bids have been denied so far, and he remains locked up at San Quentin State Prison. Number 4. Josh Griffin 26-year-old cocktail waitress Kim Medlin disappeared one day in 1997 while driving home from her job at a strip club in Charlotte, North Carolina. Her Jeep was found on the side of the road about two hours after her shift finished up. Kim's purse and money were inside the vehicle, but she was nowhere in sight and her driver's license was also strangely missing. The young woman's body was found the next day in a secluded industrial area about a mile and a half from her car. An autopsy revealed that Kim had been beaten, strangled and stomped on, leaving her with multiple fractures and even a broken neck. There was also evidence that her wrists had been tied up, although the ligature had been removed altogether. Investigators quickly ruled out robbery as a possible motive. They also cleared Kim's husband, Bridger, of any involvement, even though a Monroe police officer claimed to see Bridger's truck in the area around the time of the victim's death. In fact, Bridger proved to be a valuable help to law enforcement by offering insights about his wife's personality and habits. He said Kim would have never pulled over for anyone except a cop, which could explain why her driver's license was missing and her Jeep was running with the driver's side window rolled down. A witness soon came forward and said they had seen a Monroe police officer pulling Kim over before she went missing. They were able to pick the vehicle out of a lineup, and shoe prints on Kim's clothing all led to the same suspect, a 23-year-old off-duty officer named Josh Griffin. His patrol vehicle was suspiciously clean, and his shoes were absent during an initial search of his house. Just two weeks before Kim's murder, someone had aggressively followed her on her way home from work. 
She reported the road rage incident to police, and the officers on duty urged their colleagues to keep an eye out for Kim's car during the morning to ensure that she was safe while driving home alone from her job. Prosecutors theorized that Griffin overheard the broadcast and decided to take an inappropriate interest in Kim. They accused him of pulling the victim over and killing her when she rejected his advances. Griffin denied any involvement in her murder, but was still charged with the crime. He soon changed his story and claimed that some drug dealers he owed money to for steroids offered to let him repay his debt by pulling Kim over and giving her over to them. Yet he was unable to provide any information about these supposed dealers, including basic descriptions of what they looked like. He also accused a fellow officer of being involved, but the co-worker passed a polygraph and was cleared. Meanwhile, several women came forward, accusing Griffin of different harassment incidents. The disgraced former cop was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. He maintained his innocence until three years later, in 2001, when he finally confessed to the crime. According to a transcript of the confession, the murder played out as the injuries on Kim's body suggested. Afterward, Griffin tossed his shoes into a trash can, then cut up Kim's license and smashed a flashlight he beat her with, flushing the pieces down the toilet. Number 3. Patrick Ferguson in early 2021, 30-year-old Robert Lee Howard Jr.'s girlfriend reported him missing in Memphis, Tennessee. The woman told police that she found Howard's phone by tracking its location, but Howard was nowhere to be found. Suspicion quickly fell on 29-year-old Patrick Ferguson, an officer with the Memphis Police Department whose ex-girlfriend had recently left him for Howard. Ferguson allegedly admitted to kidnapping Howard at gunpoint while on duty and forcing the victim into the back of his squad car, where he proceeded to fatally shoot Howard. According to police, part of the abduction was captured on camera. The scorned cop also said he got rid of the body in one place, but moved it to a second location with help from a close friend. Four days after Howard disappeared, his body was recovered. Ferguson was instantly fired from his job and faces a laundry list of charges including first-degree murder, first-degree murder in perpetration of aggravated kidnapping, abuse of a corpse, and fabricating and tampering with evidence. He pleaded not guilty and is being held without bond. The case appears to be ongoing amid over a dozen delays in Ferguson's scheduled court hearings. Authorities also charged 28-year-old Joshua Rogers, who allegedly helped Ferguson move Howard's body with accessory, abuse of a corpse, and fabricating and tampering with evidence. Number 2. Christian White in May 2023, staff members at a nursing home in Kuma, Australia called emergency services when they decided they couldn't handle a 95-year-old resident who was holding a steak knife. Paramedics arrived on scene first and tried to de-escalate the situation by asking Claire Nowland to put the knife down. But the senior citizen, who suffered from dementia, refused to hand it over, and when police got there, she allegedly walked toward them with the blade outstretched in her hand. 33-year-old senior constable Christian White tasered Nowland, causing her to fall backwards and hit her head. She fractured her skull and died just one week later. According to staff at the facility, Nowland weighed less than 100 pounds and relied on a walker to move around. She approached the responding officer slowly, and a female officer at the scene reportedly told White that she thought she could grab the knife from Nowland's hand, but White apparently still felt it was necessary to launch his taser. After an investigation, he was charged with grievous bodily harm, assault occasioning bodily harm, and common assault. After Nowland passed away, New South Wales Police Commissioner Karen Webb said it was possible that White's charges would be upgraded to manslaughter. She said she refused to watch the footage of the incident until she was handed the final investigative report. A manslaughter charge would be grossly inadequate, according to prosecutor Peter Levac, who called for White to be charged with murder. For now, White is suspended as he awaits the next steps in the case. It wasn't the first time White's actions have caused controversy. Three years earlier, he and a colleague were criticized for their behavior during a traffic stop with a man named Alan Watts, who was suspected of being impaired by drugs. In body cam footage of the stop, White's partner could be heard threatening to break Watts' legs if he tried to run away. While allegations against the officers for their conduct were dismissed in the end, Police Commissioner Webb said that White's history will be taken into account as part of the current investigation into the nursing home incident. Number 1. Kenneth Memelar 
In September 2022, a 53-year-old police officer from Hudson Valley, New York, named Kenneth Memelar, was officially charged with fourth-degree stalking. According to state police, a series of complaints regarding incidents in the town of Middleton led to the arrest of Memelar, who was a nine-year veteran of the nearby Montgomery Police Department. A criminal complaint said that he harassed a woman with the intent of causing physical or emotional harm. The final straw came when he was accused of approaching the victim outside a grocery store. Memelar denied stalking the woman, who he claimed was an ex-girlfriend, trying to drag him through the mud after their relationship ended. Speaking with the Times Herald Record, he admitted to simply crossing paths with the victim in a parking lot, but he insisted he was just there to shop and that the encounter was simply the result of bad timing. He said he approached a woman because he still had some of her belongings in his car and wanted to return them to her. According to Memelar's version of events, she ignored him, got into her car and drove away. The criminal complaint tells a different version of events, though. Based on video evidence of the incident, Memelar was accused of waiting for at least 16 minutes before making contact with the woman in the parking lot. At the time of his arrest, he was already on leave thanks to an injury. His superiors decided that he would stay out of the job pending the outcome of the case. Memela told the Herald Record that he looked forward to proving his innocence and clearing his name one day. Thanks for watching. Many heroes are humble about their deeds, and some don't even like being called a hero, while others have no problem taking credit for their actions and find purpose in passing on their story. How do you think you'd react if you suddenly fell into the spotlight for an act of selfless bravery? Let us know in the comments down below, and be sure to subscribe to the channel to see more.